Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. We're going to continue going through these charts. I actually found more mistakes, but the mistakes are always interesting, as are the corrections. So before we begin, can we close? Or can we open with a word? <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time we have this morning. We just ask for your spirit's presence as we open your word together. And um, we pray for one another. We know the trials that we all face. And we ask that you can bless us and help us in all that, that you want us to do. Help us to be obedient to your voice. And um, we pray, Lord, that you can guide and direct this study. I thank you for correcting our mistakes and uh, the things that you've been showing us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, well, good morning again, everyone. So I know this is probably a little tiny on some of your devices, but uh, what you see at the top there is, you know, connecting George Bush the first with George Bush the second. We had that 3,615 days, right? So that was from the end of the Gulf War to the inauguration of George Bush. So that one has not been affected. What was affected is the word operation. So I had written it as 4369, but it's actually 4639. So my dyslexia numbers, uh, dyslexia of numbers sometimes causes problems. But I still think that what we did, the mistakes that we made are still valid. That is, this switching of things uh, still gave us these symbols that we could use. Now, but when, and, and that one, when I correct it, so it ends up being, so, and then that's why I'm, 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 so I had the right number before, but it's just when I'd written this out. So if you add 4639 plus desert, which is 4057 plus, uh, shield, which is 4043, you still get this number 12,739 days. So that would, went from the end of, the Soviet Afghan war to January 2nd, when we first had done that calculation and, and had addressed that. So it went to that date, January 2nd, 2024. So, so that one's still valid. It's still very significant. So for some reason I had added that one up correctly, but these other ones I hadn't. So when we look at operation desert storm and we use the one, uh, the word from uh, Daniel 11 verse 40, so the 8175, we get 16,871 days. So it's not the 16,601 that we had yesterday that we were working with. Now that one goes from May 2nd, 1984, which is um, one of the meetings between Reagan and Pope John Paul II. I think it's the second meeting. And you could count that to July 10th, 2030. So July 10th is a symbol of the 10th day of the seventh month. And if we count it from July 30th in 1984, and what I'm going to use is July 30th is the first day of the fifth month in 1984. So I should put this in here. So 1984, we got the July 30th, which is the first day of the fifth month. That symbol, if we take this Operation Desert Storm, using that number, will bring us to the 10th day of the seventh month in 2030. So we got this um, July 10th in 2030 and October 8th in 2030. But you can see we're connecting the first day of the fifth month with the 10th day of the seventh month. So that's obviously an important symbol that connects these. Now, where it gets more interesting has to do with these dates around the, the Gulf War especially when it comes to desert storm. So if we use the word Operation Desert Storm with the storm, the number uh, 5492, so that's one of the, the numbers that you can use uh, for the word storm in the Bible, uh, you get 14,188. And if we, we count that from the start of Operation Desert Storm, January 17th, 1991, that's going to bring us to a symbolic date in 2029. Now, you, you see there it says uh, November 20th. Well, November 20th is November 7th, 
on the Julian calendar, which it would be Jeff's 78th birthday in quotation marks, because it's obviously not his first birthday. But the thing is, it's the 13th day of the eighth month. So it has that symbol of Palmona. But the one that's the more interesting is Operation Desert Storm using 5584. That gives us 14,280 days. And if we go from the end of the Desert Storm on February 28, 1991, it brings us to April 5, 2030. What would that tell us? These symbols that are tying this Desert Storm to that, that year, you know, going from the first day of the seventh month in 2029, to the 10th day of the seventh month in 2030, because we've had all of those uh, symbols in other lines. What is it about Operation Desert Storm as a symbol that would be significant in tying it, especially to April 5th, 2030? So we, we just took the, the words in the Bible, Operation Desert Storm, and there's different words for storm. There are so, so different words for desert, but I haven't looked at the other desert yet, just Operation Desert with the desert as being 4057, but the storm being 5584, what would be the significance that when we count from the end of Operation Desert Storm, we come to April 5th, 2030? What what would that mean symbolically? Any ideas? Because remember, we're looking at Daniel chapter 11, verse 16, and and maybe into 17, you know, just we're dealing with the beginning of our history, November 9th, 1989, and we have these events that occur in that period of time, in that 776 days. Oper- the Gulf War is one of the things that occurs. Operation Desert Shield, Operation Desert Storm, 168 days for Operation uh, Desert Shield, 42 days for Operation Desert Storm. So we have it in that history. And we can connect that history to this April 5th, 2030. So what would that mean? We're, we're connecting the beginning of our lines here to the end of our lines. Any any ideas? Des- with Desert Storm, you have Islam in some way a defeat or, okay. or sort of like a restraint of Islam. On yeah. April 5th, 2030, in some way typifying the closure of probation, then the four winds are fully let loose. And we've okay. seen that the four winds are connected with uh, the ceiling, and the ceiling is connected with Islam in, in this uh, Revelation chapter 9. Yeah. So we have to discern, is April 5th, 2030, is, it, is there some justification for out there being typifying the four winds being like this? So I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, so the one thing we know about April 5th, 2030 is we're not expecting anything on that date. You know, we're, we're just saying it's a symbolic date that that is an additional extension of time, pushing the events that we were expecting in our line in the 777 days. We know that that those events are not did not occur in our history and they're going to occur at a future time. And so we have this symbolic date, the first day of the first month. Now, and we also connected that first day of the first month in 2030 with September 11th, 2001, using the 3,000 or 3,000, 354 days from the first day of the first month in 457 to the first day of the first month in 456, right? So that story in Ezra, where they leave Babylon and they get to Jerusalem, they get to the River Hava, they go to Jerusalem, then they, they meet on the 20th day of the ninth month, and then they begin this divorce proceedings that are going to end on the first day of the first month, right? And they, they start on the first day of the 10th month. So there's all of these different symbols that that show whatever we're ex- we have been expecting in our time immediately, that that's pushed off to the future, specifically when we don't know. It's just tied to a symbolic date. But since we have something that has to do with Islam in the 1990s uh, being defeated, we can definitely see that that is a symbol and that it must have something to do in sort of in a reverse that in the future, Islam is going to be loosed again. Does that make sense to people? Because in this history, you know, all the way up to 2001, I mean, Islam is being restrained. I mean, we looked at, you know, the Iranian uh, hostage crisis 
right? Obviously, uh, the Soviet-Afghan war. In all of that history, Islam is seeking to fight against the United States, but they're they're losing, so to speak. I mean, obviously, they're fighting the Soviets, but, you know, there's America and Islam is tied together. They're enemies. They're sometimes allies in certain ways. But, you know, when when the Gulf War occurs, of course, they're, they're not allies at that point. And, and what happens in that Gulf War is going to be connected to what happens in that history. I mean, you're going to have the Twin Towers attacked. It's one date we haven't really looked at. I'm kind of curious about it because we have that date. What's the date for when the Twin Towers are attacked by a bomb? Anybody remember the date? We also have Waco in that history, so that might help you. Yes, yeah, February sometime, maybe the 26th or I can't remember exactly yet. Yeah. 26th, right? And then it's going to be two days later on February 28th, I believe, in 1993, that you're going to have the Waco. Right? So Waco is going to be uh, February 28th. So that's going to be two years to the day from the end of the Gulf War, because the Gulf War ends on February 28th, 1991. So, and, th- and then that's going to end on April 19th, 1993, right? So that's when the, the Mount Carmel Center uh, is burned down, right? April 19th. So you've got that February 28th to April 19th. It's a period of 50 days, is it? I think 50 days. If it was 1993 for Mount Carmel, that'd be quite a bit more than 50 days, wouldn't it? No, it's 1993, February 28th, 1993 to April 19th, 1993. Okay, I thought you were talking about that February 28th, 91 to that. Yeah, so February 28th, 91 to February 28th, 93 is exactly two years. So from the end of the Gulf War to Waco is exactly two years. That makes sense? Looking at it. Both February 28th, right? Now, two days before that, that's when the Twin Towers are first attacked, right? So that's the bombing of the World Trade Center. And and if they had been successful, and they could have been, um, you know, we wouldn't have ended up having 9-11, but they weren't successful. So, you know, so there is some stuff in there that we probably uh, could look at. But at this point, you know, we're just... We're, we're just uh, reminding ourselves about some of these dates. Just looking at this here. So uh, I just put this date in here to see if there's anything that shows up. Yeah, because that's from February 28th of 91 to February 28th of 93 is 731 days. Ah, two years, yeah. And, and that's two years where you have a leap year in there, right? Correct. So that's why you get the uh, the one at the end. If it's two years where there's no leap year in between the count, then it's just 730. So anyway, that's that's another thing that we would look at um, at some point, you know, look at, at these connections. But what we do is we do have these these connections with this desert storm in that history with the history that's coming up. So Islam has been in this history restrained. And really the restraint that happens at 9-11 is, is really kind of the ultimate restraint. That's, that's sort of where they're really restrained. If you understand what I'm saying? Because there's, there's lots going on in this history, right? But then they're going to be restrained at 9-11. You know, they're, they're, that, that restraint, that holding back the four winds is something that's going on, right? There's, they're like an angry horse seeking to be let loose. So at 9-11, they're finally restrained. And there's lots that goes on in there because the fall of the Soviet Union, I mean, is obviously connected to this, right? I mean, because you have the Soviet-Afghan war, for one, that's going to to ultimately lead. It's part of what leads to this. So this is a very involved history, but I think it's pretty significant that we can take the word Operation Desert Storm and a phrase, find Hebrew words that line up with those words, and that they're going to go from the end of Operation Desert Storm to April 5th, 2030, a date that we've studied quite a bit. So I think that's it's highly unlikely, you know. 
Now, the other thing is th this process that we're going through. So people watching this, I mean, they're watching the processes of us making a lot of mistakes. And, and we make lots of mistakes, right? Like when we're trying to figure something out, uh, there is a trial and error that goes along. But a lot of the mistakes, I think, are significant. Like I wouldn't just dismiss those mistakes where, where we invert some numbers and we get numbers that work is, is not an accident. Does that make sense to people? So, I mean, there's probably still more because there's other words for desert that we could use. Um, sort of exhausted the words for storm. There, there's one other word for storm I could use. Maybe, maybe another number, maybe two different numbers. But I think we've found enough to know that what we're doing here with Daniel chapter 11 is valid, right? So, so we, we can argue that it's valid, uh, that we have significant symbols in this history that ties us to these significant events, and especially the symbol of July 18 and September 11th. Just because this verse, verse 16, has a lexical sum of 47,903, and from July 18, 1870 to September 11th, 2001, it's that many days, inclusive count, right? And so we're connecting what's happened with the, with papal infallibility as a symbol, with the United States being conquered at 9-11. And the beginning of the Sunday law really is beginning, right? That's redundant, but, right? So the beginning of the Sunday law, where we, we mark it in our history, it really commences at September 11th, 2001. Even though we have November 9th, 1989, it's not really the Sunday law, right? September 11th is. And that Sunday law, of course, on the bigger line, Ellen White's line, that is our line. When we zoom into that Sunday law, we get our line, including November 9th, 1989. But the main focus is the arrival of the second angel, which is September 11th, 2001. So what we found when we were studying judges, what we found in, in all of our study of understanding the lines, those things can now apply as we look at Daniel chapter 11. So, you know, somebody looking on and just seeing a little bit of what we're doing, they could be very confused. It seems like a bunch of nonsense. And that's that's the problem I have sort of the videos that we've done this week is, you know, they're very involved, very kind of, you know, I don't know how people could watch them personally unless they had watched a lot of our stuff. But there's a lot of people contacting me, especially after Jeff had spoken giving support for what we're doing, people from other countries. So I've had people from Africa talking about it, people from Peru, people from the U.S., people that have been in this message and saying, you know, just keep going, right? We're, we're watching. So something is happening in the movement. The movement, I think people are starting to understand uh, what this is about. A lot of people have contacted me and said they now are getting it, and especially that that Jeff is playing the role of Miller. Right? Now, I didn't join the study on Sabbath. I could have, but I chose not to. And you know, and I, I sort of thought, well, you know, I could, you know, I could have gone on there, but I didn't think it would be pretty. Uh, do people agree with me that it probably wouldn't have turned out well if I'd gone on to that study? I don't think that it would have turned out very well at all. No. So I can't remember what that saying is. Something about is, is the something about valor that uh, the, discretion the, is the better part of valor. It's the yeah, the greater part of valor. So so I was trying to use discretion there. I was trying to say, well, you know, sometimes it's just better to allow people to to figure things out and. Uh, and not not get involved. So <clears throat> that's what I, what I chose to do. But I do think, you know, what we are seeing happening in the movement right now is very significant. And so this, you know, this December 30th date was extremely important. Now, Aran, you have some calculations that that can you share those with us that you were telling me about before the study? Are they going to not make sense? Because you were counting the number of days 
from from different events. I know my birthday was in there. Yeah, I just had some dates, a couple dates. I don't know, but yeah, I had my birthday but, on the on the, and I had the I still had January twenty first on the calendar converter. So it ended up being fifteen thousand eight hundred days to the sale of the school of the profits. Um, so when we go, yeah, so let, let, let's go to these charts here that we have. So this is going to deal with, I guess we could use this chart here just to look at. So just hang on, I'm going to share this. So we had the sale of the School of the Prophets 187 days after July 18, 2020. And that's going to be 50, 153 weeks and three days before Jeff speaks on July, uh, you know, against July 18, 2020, and rejects the use of symbolic days and numbers in relation to time, right? So, I mean, he had written about it prior to that, but this is the first time we get to hear Jeff's voice saying that he rejects this, right? But you were looking at this January 21st, 2021. And so you noticed from your birthday, which is October 19th, 1977, right? Yeah. Uh, that is 18,500 days. Right. Okay. And I don't think I actually put any dates in the calendar. It was, it was previous to today. I just was looking at it, and then I saw these things, and I saw that um, I had your birthday in there, and I also saw that it was 21,169 days to the same yeah. date, which right. is so, basically relates to Stephen's birthday. Yeah. So Stephen is is born, um, like I'm born February 6, 63, and Stephen's born uh, February 11th, 69. So we're born um, 2,197 days apart. So from my birthday, you're saying it's 2,000 or 21,169 days to the sale of the School of the Prophets, yeah. right? And that number, 21169, what is that number, Stephen? Uh, you know, if you were Canadian. I mean, no, Europeans don't do it that way, or the Irish. But what would 21169 be, Stephen? Uh, 21, say it again, sir. Two. One, February, one. February 11th, 69. Yeah, the date you were born. So so that ties mine and Stephen's birthday together, but it ties it to the School of the Prophet sale, right? So so I think that's fairly significant in understanding uh, this history. Uh, the reason why, you know, Stephen and Iran and myself, why our birthdays are significant is because our birthdays are part of these lines in relation to time, right? Now, I think other people's birthdays can be significant in lines as well. So it doesn't make us prophets or anything like that. You know, um, you know, there's lots of dates, there's lots of birthdays, and, you know, people's birthdays are going to line up on significant dates. But ours are part of structures. You know, like Stephen is born 11,900 days before 9-11, and that number 11,900 is the number uh, from the Islamic calendar to uh, the Gregorian calendar, 32 years and seven months on our calendar, 33 years and seven months on the Islamic calendar. So so those types of things that, you know, Stephen is born 32 years and 11 months prior to 9-11 um, makes his birthday significant as a symbol, and it showed up as a symbol in other times. So what we can say is that God has given us these numbers as a witness. The numbers themselves, we have not used them to create anything. They're just a witness. Now, we could say, well, we have some dates in the future, but those dates are symbolic dates. They're witnesses to the structure of our lines, to the significance of our lines. They're not a prediction about events that are going to happen. Now, it could be some dates we have in the future, something might happen on those dates. But it's not anything we could predict. We can measure the time and we can see after the fact that it was the time. You know, for instance, I had I had known that December 30th, uh, 2023 was 1260 days after July 18, 2020. I mean, I'd known that before July 18, 2020. 
But there's no way that I could have predicted that Jeff is going to speak on that date and renounce July 18th and 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 the symbolic use of numbers and dates in in relation to time, right? There's no way that I could predict that. You know, even the day before, I wouldn't have predicted that. I wasn't predicting anything on December 30th, 2023. So we need to understand what we're doing, that we, we've established, we're establishing what Jeff was teaching at the beginning, right? We know that our history, the history of our line from 1989 and even before, is the subject of Daniel chapter 11. And we're seeing it now as we look at the history of pagan Rome and we look at the symbols uh, that are connected to it. And then and we started looking at Operation Desert Storm. So we just took the Hebrew numbers for Operation Desert and Storm and Oper- Operation Desert and Shield and found that they fit into our lines. That they tie what's happening at the beginning of our line with what's going to happen at the end. So we know that there's that our history, that our line has within it way marks that repeat, right? Okay, so so I think we're done with with verse sixteen, and uh, we started looking at verse seventeen. So I mean, there's probably things we will come back to. Now, in this uh, historical application that we're that we're looking at here. Again, this is from Swearingen's book, right? So he he's going to um, have some differences of view on some things, but a lot of it is the same as what we already understand. But we have to go through, check this, and correct it where he's making an error. So we know in verse 17, when we have Rome overruns the kingdom of the south. So this is going to be Rome conquering Egypt. And when does that happen historically? What is this story about? Because I've been I've been watching some of this history on YouTube trying to understand it. Because you have a a civil war between Pompey and Julius Caesar. You have a breakup of the triumvirate. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So so first you have this. um, Now the triumvirate is what? Caesar, Pompey, and isn't Lucius Crassus? Yeah, so Crassus. So Julius Caesar, Pom- Pompey, and Crassus. So they have this in, in um, well, it's going to start in 60 BC, right? Okay, so let's, if we if we play this with a, a more modern equivalent. Okay. Caesar was the military man that received more glory because of of all of the things that he had accomplished. Okay. Then you have Pompey, who was also military, but was not quite as lifted up as Caesar. Yeah. You have Crassus, who, if, if if we drop the final symbol of his name, he was a crass man, but he was a man that was very, very wealthy. Okay. Yeah. So he's so, got money. So if we were if we were going to apply this in a current situation, Caesar would be Trump, Pompey would be Biden, Crassius would be uh, um uh trying to think of uh the German that's so hated. Yeah, you're talking about um, looking in the wrong box in my head. The World Economic Forum you're talking about? No, 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 no. Oh, you're talking about like um, the, is it uh, like the ger- president of Germany or whatever? Prime no, 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 I'm, I'm talking about, he's a man that uh, very, very wealthy and he's been contributing to a lot of the very woke. Soros? Soros. Soros. So is it possible that we could have that type of a literal situation right now? Okay. Well, let's let's look at the historical application first. So after they conquer 
Jerusalem in 63. Three years later, they're going to form this triumvirate. And when it says, he shall set his face to enter the strength, um, enter with the strength of his whole kingdom, that this is Julius Caesar, he's going to conquer Egypt. He has to conquer the rest of, of that empire, right? So he's going to, they're going to conquer Egypt, the south. Now it says, and upright ones with him, Jewish forces loyal, loyal to Caesar, led by Antipater. So that's what it says here. So there's there's going to be this whole thing with uh, Cleopatra as well uh, later on, right? So, um, you know, trying to understand this whole history of what happens in Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, it to me, it, when I read it, it's just too sketchy. I don't know enough of the history uh, to really understand how he's interpreting this. Uh, but the basic idea is that they're going to uh, seek to have the whole kingdom. Now, the upright ones with him, they're going to be interpreted as, uh, I'm not really sure. I'm trying to figure out what, how he understands this part of it. Uh, the Jews, I guess, is what he's saying, uh, who gave Caesar the assistance already mentioned. Without this, he must have failed. With it, he completely subdued Egypt in 47 BC. The daughter of woman corrupting her was Cleopatra who had been Caesar's mistress and the mother of his son. His infatuation for the queen kept him much longer in Egypt than his affairs required. Now, I know that whole story. I watched a documentary dealing with what happened when he went into Egypt. Kind of foolishly, he ended up being trapped there in, uh, I think it was Alexandria, and there was riots and things like that. And then when he finally got back, it's kind of amazing that he even was able to retain uh, the control of Rome after that. But it says, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. After this, he shall turn his face unto the isles and take many. But a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. So there's just, you know, a well understood way of looking at these passages. But when we look at, at this passage, I mean, we see symbols here. So we see Rome under Julius Caesar. He's going to seek to conquer Egypt. And the Jewish forces are going to be part of this, right? So that's the idea that they have here is that the Jews um, are participating in conquering Egypt. So Rome is going to begin this subjugation of Egypt. And he shall give him the daughter of women. Cleopatra, corrupting her, making her his mistress, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him, could not prevent his assassination. Now, what do we think about this verse, verse 17 of Daniel 11? What do we see as symbols? Not just who, what happened historically, but what are the symbols here? Okay, we have a woman. What, what does a woman symbolize? Symbolize the church. <clears throat> Yeah, so woman symbolizes the church. So, I mean, we would have to say that Cleopatra must represent a church of some sort if, if we're going to make an application to our time. Now, I'm, I'm just going to add these Hebrew numbers in here. All right, so you get this word set, which I guess is just like the word land, 776. This is 7760. So it has a symbol that represents that. Okay, so he's going to set his face to enter Egypt. Any any thoughts here still? Six. Okay, so Egypt is representing what? Because we're saying he's going to enter Egypt. He's going to set his face to enter Egypt. Egypt represents, so we've got a woman representing the church. Egypt represents? The world. Okay, it represents the world, but specific at, at this time, it's, it's... It's king of the south. Yeah, so it's going to represent... We could just say the UN, you know, or, you know, atheistic communism. Right? So it could represent that. Now, with the strength of his whole kingdom. Okay. So this, this word strength, 8633, it means authority or power or strength. That's toket. To, to, tokef. Doesn't occur very often in the Bible. It occurs in Esther, occurred twice, and in Daniel, once. 
Daniel eleven seventeen. So what does he mean? He sets his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom. Any thoughts on this? Why the whole kingdom? Why was it mentioning the whole kingdom here? Well, uh, Caesar would have the support of Rome. Okay. But he knows. Yeah. Rather than Mark Anthony. Okay. Yeah. He would be more aligned with Cleopatra and Greece. Yeah. So they, they call this the second triumvirate or something? What do they call that? Like when he aligns, I, I'm trying to remember how this works, but you got Julius Caesar, Mark Anthony, and Cleopatra, right? Yes, I think you're right. Yeah, he's more with uh, Augustus. That's with Augustus? Okay, so I'm trying to remember how it goes. Okay, so Mark Anthony is with Augustus. So when is that going to be? That's at the well, death. There are 31. Okay, so that's later on. Okay. So this here, we don't, we have Cleopatra. Is this the same Cleopatra? Yeah, you're so, yes. Your, your second triumvirate was from 43 to 32 BC. Okay. And so then this got, is, yeah. You have a period of nine years where the first triumvirate was for a period of seven years. Okay. And so the first triumvirate, that's going to be Caesar, Crassus, and, uh, Pompey. And Pompey. Okay. Now, um, now, now Caesar is going to die what year? In 40, does he die in 46 or 45? When does he die? I think Caesar dies in 44. 44, okay. Okay. Yeah, I know, I just know it's after he makes, uh, the, the Julian calendar. That, you know, he died, he makes the calendar before he dies, not long before he dies. Obviously, anything he does, he does before he dies, but I know it's not long before. Because I think 46 BC is the longest day in history, or the longest year in history, pardon me. Where it's going to be, I can't remember how many days. And it's, and adjusting the calendar, he ends up adding a lot of days to that year, I believe. And the Julian calendar begins in 46. So, okay, so in 44, he's going to die in the Ides of March. Correct. Yeah, okay. So, when we have pagan Rome under Julius Caesar, now we're normally having pagan Rome representing papal Rome, right? All right, continue. Okay, so so we would just say this is the papacy. Now, it's the papacy in this history after 9-11. So what's happening in that history after 9-11 with the papacy? Because, you know, we had the papacy there exalting itself to establish the vision in verse 14, and then you're going to have it conquering the United States, right? You're going to have all this stuff that's going to end up, you know, with the New World Order speeches, the time of the end, and then finally the papacy stands in the glorious land in 9-11, and it does bring us to our history as well. That is, it's saying it's going to go up to that history. By his hand, he shall be consumed. So it brings us to you know, to November 19th, 2019. It brings us into the present. But after 9-11, what is the papacy doing? Because it, it did a lot of things before not 1989. You know, you have the fall of the Soviet Union. It conquers the United States, we're saying, at 9-11. Now, you're still going to have uh, Pope John Paul II. He's going to die, I can't remember what year, 2000, 2005. So he's Pope from 78 to 2005. Then you have Benedict um, from 2005 to 13, and then you have Pope Francis in 2013 to the present, right? So, so what's happening in that history? What what is it that we need to pay attention to? Yeah, just looking at the notes here. Okay. So what I have is he and Julius Caesar shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his old kingdom. So this has been applied to Caesar's determination and actions. That will eventually lead to Rome subjugating Egypt and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do. So the upright ones, as you say, Uriah Smith relates to the Jews who assisted the armies who passed through Judea with the aim of aiding Julius Caesar when he was besieged in Alexandria. And he shall give him the daughter of women corrupting her. So Caesar takes Cleopatra as a mistress. But yeah. she shall not stand on his side, neither be for him. So Cleopatra was not, was later not a support for Caesar. 
Yeah. Supposedly yeah. when he when he was uh, naived. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, and I watched a documentary dealing with this whole history of how Julius Caesar got together with Cleopatra and and what happened there. So the when he's he's in Alexandria there in Egypt. So what is Julius Caesar representing? I mean, we say it's the papacy, but as far as uh, setting his face to enter Egypt with the strength of his whole kingdom. So what is the papacy doing in this history? You know, they, they conquered the United States at 9-11. What are they doing? What, what is that history from 9-11 to the present? I mean, is the papacy doing anything? To bring to bring the world to its um to to him. Okay. He's busy, he's busy. He's busy under. He's busy trying to conquer the king of the um, king of the south, which is Egypt. Okay. So the thing is, you have Pope John Paul II. He's a very popular pope. Now, after nine eleven, I mean, he's pretty elderly in that in that history from nine eleven till his death in two thousand five. Now. Is the papacy at this point, you know, especially under Francis, or, or not Francis, but uh, Benedict, is the papacy really popular? Some of its popularity had been lost because John Paul was seen as being a a people's pope. Right. And Benedict wasn't. Yeah. Now, now, is the papacy still operating? And how is it operating? What is it doing? What is it trying to accomplish? in this history after 9-11? It's looking more to enter into countries and gain influence. Okay, so it's working more behind the scenes in a, in a different way than it had been working before, right? Agreed. Yeah, so, so when it talks about the strength of his whole kingdom, all Caesar's military resources and upright ones with him, I mean, I don't know what the Jewish forces loyal to Caesar led by Antipater would symbolize, but they must symbolize something in our history. So the papacy is going to begin a work to conquer atheistic communism. Now, the thing under Benedict, Benedict he would be considered a, a conservative pope, right? Quite a bit. Yeah. But then you're going to have Francis. Now, Francis is woke, basically, right? We would have to say. Oh, boy. Yeah. So when it says to enter Egypt with the strength of his whole kingdom, I don't know if we would put that really as the history of Benedict. I think we would start this with Francis. And, and it's not conquering Egypt so much, but entering into Egypt to basically use Egypt to its ends. So the subjugation of Egypt, in this case uh, here, would be basically utilizing or using the woke culture to promote the Catholic Church. So we, we could say definitely under Francis, well, we saw that with this movement, the young people in this movement, do they like Pope, uh, Pope Francis? The, the ones that follow Parminder and Tess. And the question, why? You know, why did they follow, why, why did they follow Parminder and Tess? And why are Parminder and Tess a supporting uh, Pope Francis as a good Pope. Well, isn't it more that Francis seems to be more, quote, tolerant of sin? He doesn't want to call sin what it is. Yeah. In any manner. Yeah. So he's a very um, postmodern Pope, right? Okay. So, so he's a product of postmodernism which isn't really something you would think about the papacy in the past, but definitely it's postmodern. And so, um, so the papacy has taken over Egypt, right? And now that this thing about this upright ones with him, so we're saying that historically this is the Jewish force forces loyal to Caesar led by Antipater. Now we need, we need to take a look at this a little more closely. So as far as upright, those are straight. Um, if you just look at the definition of the word, it means um, straight, upright, correct. So these are not, this is not the evil. It's yashar is the Hebrew word. It means straight or even. So who are these upright ones? Now we can say they're the Jews in that history. That makes sense. 
But who would they be in our history? Would that be the church? Okay. Um, what church? Well, we're using the example of Jewish forces loyal to Caesar led by Antipater. Okay. So the Seventh-day Adventist church becoming right. woke? Uh-huh. Okay. I, I think that probably makes sense. But then, th so this kingdom, because the strength of his whole kingdom, and even the upright ones, even the Seventh-day Adventist church, coming along with this. Now, I don't really follow so much what's going on in the Adventist church. I do know there's a lot of wokeism going around. I, I don't know how how the left within the Adventist church sees Francis. Maybe somebody knows how how they see him, whether they see him as a good pope or whatever, I would assume. Now, even if we're dealing with upright ones, I mean, we could just say it's part of this movement, though we wouldn't really say they're straight or correct or upright, but but of course, neither is the church. So so these are ones that just maybe have a name of being upright. But so whatever it is, it's it's those that should be standing for truth, standing upright for truth, uh, but they're going to be supporting this work of the papacy, wh whoever they are specifically. And thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women. So uh, it's kind of weird, the daughter of women, right? So why the phrase the daughter of women? I mean, men are from women as well, but the daughter of women, what particularly is this phrase trying to say? So daughter is just bat, you know, bath. And woman, of course, is ish or isha. And so you got these two words. So the daughter of women, giving him the daughter of women and then corrupting her. That is to of decrypt. course, if you if you add those two phrases together, daughter of women, you come up with 2125. Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> 2125. Be nice if it was 2120. But 2520, I mean. So 2125, what's that mean then? Well, if you rearrange the digits, of course, you're missing or you're adding one above 2520. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we got 2125. Um, I don't know if this is right or not, but it, it took me to 17.5, Revelation 17.5, which says the mother of harlots and abomination of the earth. Yeah, so, yeah, so... um yeah, so obviously giving him the daughter of women, these would have to deal with churches, right? Oh. This is the daughter of, of the woman. So these are dealing with uh, the Protestants. So, I mean, what we see happening in the world today is we do see not just Seventh-day Adventists, not just Parminder and Tess's movement, but basically a lot of the religious world uh, buying into this woke ideology. In, in the religious world. So, I mean, I'm not, you know, we're just trying to figure these things out here, but if we take these symbols, that's how we would normally apply them. Now, um, she shall not stand. So you're going to have that word uh, not low, right? And then stand, that's the word that, you know, is used all throughout Daniel 11, talking about like withstand and stands and so forth. And neither before him. So this is a word uh, to exist. It's kind of a strange word. So this daughter of women is not going to be for him. So this would be the papacy. So does that make sense? We're saying that the he here is Julius Caesar, who represents the papacy. He's representing pagan Rome, which represents papal Rome. You got Seventh-day Adventists, the upright ones. And you have uh, the daughter of women, the Protestant churches. Now, it says he shall give him the daughter of women. Who's the he and who's the him? At the Stephen. beginning of the passage, if he shall set his face to enter yeah. the strength of his whole kingdom, aren't we talking king of the north shall set to decide that he is going to enter the entire kingdom of the king of the south. Okay. Well, so who's the he and who's the him? That's what I'm trying to define here. We have we have to decide at the outset who we are who we're referring to. 
with he. Correct. Yeah, but remember, Hebrew isn't like that. Then in English, yes. In English, yes. If it talks about he and then it says he again, it's going to be the same he. But not in Hebrew. It doesn't doesn't work that way. So the he shall give him. The him could still be the he in the beginning of the verse. Could be. Right? So that's all I'm saying. is It's not always as straightforward in Hebrew when it comes to the, uh, the personal pronouns. Then in this situation, if we were to go to the Hebrew now, how would the verse read? Okay. Well, you want me to translate it? Well, okay. If Okay, so I'll just tell you what I know. Okay, so you shall enter into with the strength of his whole kingdom. Right, and on the upright ones with, and then it has a vav, the consecutive vav, vav consecutive. So that's uh, vasa, that is to make or accomplish. So it's got the word noun, feminine, and singular, abat, with a vu at the beginning, and then it has anashim, which is. So this word women could actually be uh, a word for a burnt offering, but uh, spelt the same. And to give, not, okay, and then corrupting her to corrupt and not stand and not exist. That's strange. <clears throat> okay, so so what we have is it's not really clear as far as trying to figure out the, the personal pronouns here. Because remember, these are just have to do with uh, the forms of the word. Right. So the words are formed in a certain certain way, uh, you know, masculine or feminine. So he shall give. That doesn't make sense. I'm going to look at some other translations because this doesn't make any sense what I'm looking at. Okay, so this word, that's what I thought. Okay, where it says he he shall give him the daughter of women, it says he hath wrought and the daughter of daughter of woman he giveth to him to corrupt her. Um, so the course is who is he has wrought. So is this he shall give a verb yet ten? Yeah, Natan. Okay, so what you have is, uh, yeah, this word Natan, Right is to give. That's like where you get Nathan or Jonathan, you know, given of Jehovah, or Nathaniel, given of God. Right. So he shall give him. So this word uh, give is. It's just that the form it's in. I'm trying to figure this out. Okay, just hang on. Yeah, it's in a very strange form. Okay, so I'm not sure. You know exactly. So. So the word, the way that it's actually um, spelled here is vav tet nun. So it's not even I wouldn't even recognize that word normally in Hebrew. Just the form that it's in, because it's written here as yitin. Uh, but the root, so it's the imperfect third person masculine singular. So that's why to give to give him or give him. Then it says not. If it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So the idea there is it has a negation there, which just must be a Hebrew idiomatic expression, right? To give, because it says uh, to give not to corrupt her. So maybe that word to destroy or corrupt, you know, it all, like I would normally translate it to not corrupt her, but, but that must be a Hebrew expression. Because it doesn't really make sense. Because it says he'll give not to him. So the daughter of woman shall he give not corrupting her. But it doesn't make sense. So I don't know. But it, it still doesn't help us to understand um, who the he is. He shall give the give him the daughter of woman. It doesn't really tell us who this who these two people are, which the he is referring to who. Because, you know, in here, he shall set his face to enter the strength of his own kingdom and upright ones with him. 
thus shall he do, and he shall give him. Well, who's the him? Is that if the him and the he are the same person, that wouldn't make sense. Yeah. So there's lots of disagreement. I'm just reading some commentaries here dealing with how to understand this passage, the, the language. So this word women here, so that's what we need to look at. So isha or nashim, nashim, woman, wife, female. Now, the form of that word, also isha, can be translated as a burnt offering, but I don't think that that's the intention there. Because esha means fire. So you get isha, isha, it's spelt exactly the same, pronounced the same. So it's just uh, a hominin uh, in Hebrew. I don't think there's any connection between a burnt offering and a woman. So I don't, I don't have the answer to this really. I don't know who the he and the him are. This just, uh, this is, uh, Kiel and Dillich's commentary just saying, uh, regarding, according to Luther to come with the strength of his whole kingdom. Um, the king of the north intends thus to come with the force of his whole kingdom to obtain full possession of the kingdom of the south. And then it says this, this, um, so this idea of this, the upright ones is an explanatory clause defining the manner in which he seeks to gain his object, that which is straight while in his commentary he translates the word with him having an intention. So he's talking about Luther's translation. Uh, the sense of the passage is determined according to the uh, Lashat with the intention of establishing direct right relation, namely a means of political marriage, uh, to bring to himself the kingdom of the south, forms a clause by itself. It's pretty technical here. Um, so the daughter of woman, he shall give him the daughter of women. That's the plural of the class, and it says, it says Judges 14.5, which talks about um, Samson and the young lion roared against him, right? So when he goes down to Timnath, so it refers us to that. And Zechariah 9, 9, talking about the ass and the foal, the cult of the ass. So it's kind of interesting. I'm going to have to think about this a little bit, uh, what this verse means. So when it says it's the he, I mean, this could just be the idea of like the father giving his daughter. So it's just that, that he's get that she's given in marriage is usually how it would be used, but this is to her corruption. And the idea that, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. So this would be a type of marriage in which, you know, a woman is given in marriage. She's corrupted, um, but she, so it's not a loyal marriage. That's the idea that's here in the Hebrew. Is it possible that this would be a false covenant? Yeah, that's, that's, I kind of think is what, if we're going to apply it, it has to be some kind of covenant. So I think we have to think about this verse quite a bit. You know, one of the things about the verse, of course, is it's 1117. So 11 times 17 is 187 and, and 1117 is the 187th prime number. So, uh, so it's definitely something we're going to have to think about a bit more. And, and it definitely applies when we look at the historical application. It's, you know, it, it fits, but it's just when we start to apply it to our time that there's some nuances here that need to be understood. And, and I think, you know, cause, cause this idea of giving the daughter of women, this is the idea of giving it a woman in marriage, right? So when it says he shall give him the daughter of women, that is, the father's giving his daughter to wife. Does that make sense? Well, okay, does it make sense? Yes, because how else are you going to give the daughter of women? Right. So a man has to do that, not the mother. Right. Okay. So there's something in there in understanding that phrase, that the he is not some necessarily a person in history that we would apply but it's just the idea of that she's being given as a wife, but in this case, corrupting her to her ruin. Right. Okay. And, and that is now it says, but she shall not stand. You know, again, these, these, uh, 
words like but and 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 so forth. And also, you know, they're just they're just putting it into English. I mean, I wouldn't think it's but. I would think it's and she shall not stand or she shall not stand. You know, the idea is that in this corruption, right, this is not a marriage that is going to last. And she's not going to be for him, right? So it'd be like, you know, a father giving his daughter, you know, as a wife to someone and, and she has no, no real interest in him, right? She's, she's going to play the harlot. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's now this idea of this word be, I mean, it's, it means to exist. That is to become or come to pass or continue, right? So she's not going to continue for him. This is a temporary arrangement. So, so we're going to need to understand not just the historical application here, which we're going to have to nail down that, that we fully understand it. I have to watch some more videos and read some more history to try to understand this history. But I definitely think that we can apply it to our time and we have to apply it to what's happening in the present time. You know, after 9-11, basically in the time of Francis, because that that to me seems like the only place where we could place this. But we'll still see. There's a lot of verses we have to study. Any final thoughts? Quite yet. OK, well, let's pray. Now, dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love. We ask for your presence today. For your angels care and protection for our loved ones and um, we pray, Lord, that you can use us to represent you. Uh, thank you for this day and for the study and for the way that you correct us and help us to continue to learn and grow. Be with each person, we pray and ask in Jesus' name.